today we're at Battery Lothringen on the south coast of Jersey and this is a battery consisting of four gun emplacements uh, armed with German naval uh, guns dating back to the First World War. It was manned by the German Navy and the gun behind me is one of the original guns which was mounted here. The name Lothringen comes from a class of battleships of the First World War and several batteries were named after ships of that line and the guns mounted on these batteries came from those ships. Around the battery we will find many bunkers which support the, uh, the guns here, anti-aircraft bunkers, personnel bunkers and ammunition bunkers of course for the, the guns themselves. The most important bunker on the site is the command bunker. That is a very large bunker and is unique in Jersey and one of four in the Channel Islands. Before we go into the command bunker, the most prominent thing that you see on the outside is this rangefinder. And this would be used by the, the German uh, crew to determine how far away a target was. In very simple terms, it works on the basis that it's like a long tube with a fixed lens on one end and a movable lens on the other. And the crew would then turn some knobs, focus the two lenses together, and when they're in focus, they'd read off the distance. And why that works, well, it's all to do with Pythagoras. And if you remember your maths from school, the right angle triangle rule, if you know you've got a right angle, you know the distance to the next angle, and you've got the the measurement of that angle you can work out how far away uh, the other angle is. So this is really quite different to many of the other bunkers in the island in that we've got this long flight of stairs. We really feel as if we're getting down into the bowels of the earth. Just going past the entrance defences for the bunker and then into the main bunker itself through these armoured doors. And what you see in here is qu quite unique in the sense of bunkers over here. The size of it is much, much bigger. You can just see the, the amount of space down here. It's not like a small cramped bunker. This bunker was manned 24 hours a day. The crew of 25 they would have been billeted up the road uh, at the old holiday camp and they would have come down to do their shift on the battery. You remember when we were up on the top of the bunker we saw the range finder and the armoured turret. Well, let's go and have a look down here uh, and uh, get underneath the turret. This is actually another range finder here which uh, would have been used before the bunker was constructed. Same principle, long tube with lenses at either end. If you look up into, the, into the, the steel turret up here, you can see uh, the periscopes and the rangefinder. And underneath here, this is the main operational area of the bunker. This is where the crew uh, would work taking the angles, the bearings, the measurements and so on, calculating the ranges and directions and making all the allowances for wind, atmosphere and so on. So they didn't have computers at that stage, but they did have mechanical uh, calculators and, that, and these represent some of the sort of equipment they would have held uh, here. Now on the wall over here, this is really quite interesting because this really explains what the Germans were trying to achieve by placing the artillery around the Channel Islands, including this battery here. So in 1941, the idea was to create this sort of curtain of artillery fire, which not only protected uh, the islands and the coast of France from the outside, but equally the area between the islands and France was protected uh, f from uh, the islands themselves. So effectively it's drawing a line between the, the top of the Normandy Peninsula and Brittany through the islands. This was the principle, put some big guns on the, the continent, big guns in Guernsey, and you create this barrier. As the guns started arriving, you see the arcs of fire reach the batteries as they start being placed around the island. So by 1944, this is the extent of what was achieved by artillery. There were no less than 37 batteries across the Channel Islands. That's a staggering amount. That's more than there were in Normandy. 
the theory of 1941 didn't quite work in the sense that the, the range of the, the, the very large guns didn't quite achieve the, the theory, but nonetheless, it's a pretty good barrier. So they thought anyway. The main problem with this was that when the Allies landed in Normandy and retook Normandy and Brittany, the guns on the continent fell away and the guns on the islands didn't actually reach France. So there was nothing the islands could actually do apart from fire out to sea. And when the Germans didn't surrender in 1944 in September, Winston Churchill famously said, let them starve and blockaded the islands. And so even though they had all these guns on the islands, it was to no effect at all. At the back of the main operational area, we've got a number of rooms off the side. So we've got communication rooms here on this side. Uh, in here, this is really unusual for a, a bunker, but bear in mind it was occupied manned 24 hours a day. So we've got showers and toilets. And over here, this is a, an interesting part, and, and actually it's, it's, it's pretty standard in all bunkers. This is the escape shaft. Bear in mind that bunkers typically only have one entrance, therefore if that entrance is ever blocked, the problem for the crew is how to get out. So bunkers were typically built with escape shafts. So you can see this shaft goes through two metres of the, the wall of the bunker. And then inside of here you've got steel H-bars which are stacked up in slots in the wall, two columns of those. There would have been a brick wall built behind that with some sand between the steel and the brick. And in the event that uh, you had to escape, you would have opened the blast door from here, dismantled the steel balls inside, knocked through the brick wall and climbed up the shaft. That was your means of escape. It was means of not dying inside the bunker. It's not really a case of getting out there and continuing the fight. It was a case of escaping from being entombed in this uh, very deep bunker. The other thing on this side of the... Uh, this particular room is displayed to uh, an action which occurred off the, the headland here in August 1944. This is about as close as Jersey gets to real action uh, during the German occupation. Very briefly, an American torpedo boat squadron based out of Cherbourg, so bear in mind this is, this is after D-Day, uh, were patrolling around Channel Island waters and attacking any German shipping that they could. A convoy had left Guernsey, in fact bringing guns to Jersey to reinforce the eastern side of the island. The American torpedo boats picked up the convoy uh, and made their first attack just off Corbière on the southwest corner of the island. The convoy wasn't hit at all uh, by any of the torpedoes, uh, but of course by that stage they were now aware that there was a, a torpedo boat squadron attacking them. So when they came round the coast, off the, the, the normal point here, they, the torpedo boats came in again and the Germans were ready for them. And not only did the big guns of the battery open fire, but obviously the guns mounted on the German convoy returned fire as well. One of the torpedo boats was hit on the, uh, the wheelhouse. Commander and his uh, deputy were killed and this boat uh, ran out of control and collided with one of the, the boats in the German convoy uh, and as a result effectively blew up. The whole crew of that torpedo boat uh, perished bar one sailor who was picked out of the sea uh, by the Germans and subsequently was taken into St Helier and was in hospital for the next five months. These are remnants from the, the sunken wreck uh, which is still down at the bottom of the, uh, the, the channel here. Not much else other than the engines because they were wooden boats and underneath these are crosses, the original crosses uh, which were made for the American seamen uh, and were buried in the uh, Commonwealth War Cemetery which was created during the, the occupation in St Helier. If you think it's large up here, well we've got another floor downstairs as well. This is essentially the crew quarters down here. But on the way past here, we've got the boiler room. The Germans would have been very keen 
an interest in making sure the boiler was running to keep the bunker warm. Uh, this bunker even has radiators. So now we're in the main crew area. We've got the commander's room in here, uh, NCO's room over here. In the NCO's room, you'll see the sign, I slept here. That's where Theo Krausen, one of the German sailors who was posted at this battalion, slept. He came back uh, and identified things around the bunker for uh, the volunteers who, who run it. It wasn't the case that the German soldiers, having been taken away the prisoners of war in 1945, never came back. And if you think about it, these German soldiers, they were here because they were conscripted. Uh, they were doing their duty, and like any soldier, uh, life in, in the forces is, is something which you remember. And in, in many cases, soldiers here uh, owe their lives, really, to the fact that they were posted in the Channel Islands rather than somewhere else. Life expectancy on other fronts would have been pretty poor. However, if you were posted here, you were likely to survive. And so they came back because they regarded Jersey as something special uh, and had saved their lives. There are two prominent towers on the headland here, built 150 years apart. The first one down there is a British Napoleonic Martello Tower, and then behind me is a German Marine Peelstand, a directional observation uh, and range finding tower. And it was, constructions were started in 1943. The plan behind these was to build a network of these towers around the coastline of all the Channel Islands, Jersey, Guernsey and Alderney. And linked together, they would provide all the, the range finding and direction uh, finding for the artillery uh, on all the islands. They were never completed. Uh, only three were built in Jersey. This is number one. And they are unique to the Channel Islands. You will not find them anywhere else. So let's go and have a look inside. So this area here, we're pretty much in the round part of the tower. These towers have got four identical floors and an extra storage floor below that. So th this area here is repeated, it's identical below. Moving into the area which would actually be manned by the, the crews, obviously you've got the wide view across 180 degrees. Now we talked about range finding before and the method used using the range finder up there. Trigonometry, Pythagoras, well this is supposedly the upgrade. The problem using those long two range finders, it depends on having as long a base as possible. Because if you're trying to measure something five miles away and your base is only five metres, the likelihood of getting the range accurate at five miles is, 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 is not very good. Uh, you're going to be firing shells out there and you're going to have a plus or minus accuracy of several hundred metres at the very least. The Germans wanted greater accuracy so they built these towers. These work in a different way. They work by triangulation and essentially a crew here would be taking a bearing of the target and then the next tower, some two, three miles away, would be taking a bearing in the opposite direction, and they'd marry up those two bearings, and using triangulation, they would calculate where uh, the target was and the distance and direction of that target from any particular point on the map. So they could be so accurate by being able to say that this gun, next to this gun, next to this gun, each gun would have a slightly different bearing.
This memorial is dedicated to all the islanders who lost their lives during the Second World War. At the end of the occupation, when the island was liberated and the Germans left, uh, the headland here was purchased on behalf of the public of the island to be made into a permanent memorial. And I think it's very fitting uh, that it is like this because it's never been developed and it never will be. Uh, and those islanders who did die during the Second World War will be remembered. I hope you really enjoyed our virtual tour of Battery Lothringen. Uh, enjoyed seeing what's underground, the secrets down there. And I hope that you'll join us for another virtual tour as well.